Hey, Sacred Commons, we hope you all are well. In a relatively short amount of time, we've picked up some new subscribers to our YouTube channel. So if you're one of them, thank you. We hope that CASA is something that brings light and life, discovery and newness, hope and joy into your day. My name is John Paul Robles. I'm a priest here at the Sacred Commons, which is a convergent community. And if you want to know more about what convergence is or about the Sacred Commons, we have videos for that here on our channel. So check it out. We pray that you all are doing well with everything going on. As of today in Mahoning County, of which Youngstown is a part, we've had about 1,800 cases with 231 deaths due to COVID-19. So prayers for all of the hospital workers and doctors, uh, medical teams and staff. Continue prayers for the sick and their families. We hope that everyone is staying safe and that by God's grace you're finding patience and peace even in the midst of this. Okay, so today we are so stoked to introduce to you all someone who was on our If It Wasn't For list. It's a small list, but our guest today, Dr. Chris Green, has absolutely been a conduit of God's grace and kindness in our lives. His presence, his insight, his teaching, just him as a person. He's incredible and he's deeply blessed their lives. He's a theologian, a professor, the author of several books, including most recently, Surprised by God. This is a book that I think every Christian needs to read. It's that good. He's also written The End is Music, a companion to Robert Jensen's theology. He wrote a book called Toward a Pentecostal Theology of the Lord's Supper. And this is a book that radically transformed my life. He wrote a book called Sanctifying Interpretation, which has just been revised and expanded, and I believe the new edition will be out soon. Uh, he just received a new role at Southeastern University, where he serves now as the professor of public theology. His current research interests are focused on the doctrine of God, Pentecostal spirituality, and issues of racial and ethnic injustice. Chris serves as the teaching pastor at Sanctuary Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he's also a visual artist, an incredible artist. I recommend that you search for him on Instagram. Just look for C.E.W. Green, and you'll see his artwork there. He and his wife, Julie, have just relocated to Tulsa with their three children, Zoe, Clive, and Emery. So much of what we share here at the Sacred Commons and so much of what our friends and contemporaries share has been deeply impacted by the work and the spirit, the presence and the person of Chris Green. So without further delay, it's so great to introduce to you our guest today, part one of our interview with Dr. Chris Green. Dr. Green, it's it's wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you for your time and for, for making this uh, possible. I should start with a disclaimer that very few of these questions are mine. I did the right thing and I polled mutual friends of ours to ask you questions and these are some of the things that they sent back to me. The first question that I thought we could um, start with is actually just personal. And to give some context to people who may not know who you are, how would you describe yourself and, and where do you find yourself uh, at right now in life? It's a pretty open question. Oh man. Um, I don't know how I would describe myself, but I find myself back in Oklahoma. So my wife and I were born here and we grew up close to one another, but didn't meet until college. And then we, after, after college, we left for a while, lived in California for just a bit and came back to Oklahoma. And then eventually left Oklahoma to go to Tennessee and from Tennessee to Florida. And now we're coming back to Oklahoma again. So we are going to be living in Tulsa. We still haven't found a house yet. So we're staying with my parents, waiting to find a house, hopefully in the next week or so, because we'd like the kids to start in the fall in, in Tulsa, so in school. So that's the, that's the plan. And right now in this moment, do you f hear anything um, in your heart from God? What has God been saying to you, either personally through your journey from Florida back to Oklahoma, or just in general, uh, has God been speaking to you in any way? Well, I, th I think so. Although, I mean, I don't know what God would say about that. 
but I, I think, yeah, I, I think so. And, and about all kinds of things. I mean, whenever you're, I think all of us, like when we're in seasons of transition and we certainly have been my family and I, I think, you know, you, you're opened up to hear things you might not hear otherwise. Right. I mean, every routine is, is disrupted. And so everything is strange. And when everything is strange, you, you might notice new, 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 new words, right. Pay attention to something you, you might not otherwise pay attention to. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think so. Um, I don't know, of course, what all that's going to mean. Um, I, I had felt for a while that I was in a vocational transition. And then of course, as, as you know, and I'm sure most people who will see this know, my contract wasn't renewed for the fall at Southeastern. And that's what led us to deciding to move to Tulsa. And once we had decided to move to Tulsa and put all of those plans in motion, the university came back and offered me an entirely new position, which I got to write the job description for. And so it is, it, it has been, in fact, a, a kind of shift in vocation. And I think that's just at the beginning. I don't know where, that, where that's going to take me exactly. It, it certainly involves a new job and a job with a new set of tasks and responsibilities. I mean, I'll still be teaching, but I'll be doing more kind of public. The, 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 the role is professor of public theology. So a lot of my work will be more outside the classroom now than it has been in the past. So. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is about a shift in my vocation, but I think my wife's vocation is shifting to, you know, our kids are, especially our two oldest kids are at transitional points. Zoe's almost 16, Clive is almost 13, which those are huge shifts for them. So I think all of us kind of feel that, that shift of, you know, turning the page or breaking new ground, whatever metaphor you want. So this question was asked by our friend Paul who said, he wanted me to prime you because he's going to have this conversation with you in a minute. He was like, you should prime him on this question. So what are your thoughts on post COVID church and how it will look? I think we're a ways away from post COVID. I mean, I, I think we're probably my sense is, and I, I really hope I'm wrong about this, but my sense is it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And I think up to this point, we've mostly dealt with the frustrations of quarantining and social distancing. So we've been inconvenienced. I think what's going to happen, my guess is what I sense anyway, is what's going to happen over the next few months, next year or so, is that we're going to feel entirely different kind of pain. People we love are going to die from this disease and we're going to experience that loss and losing them under conditions in which we can't be with them the way that we want to be. I think it's going to be more and more politicized. And that's my primary concern. I'll come back to that in a moment. I also think that the economic pressures that are going to come on the backside of this <clears throat> are going to be enormous for us. Um, I think churches, schools, restaurants, you know, just the, all, all of the institutions that kind of shape the you know, our basic lives, schools, as I said, and churches most of all. I mean, I think they're gonna be changed, maybe not forever, but at least for a few years, there's gonna be serious change that is going to, it's gonna be much more than inconvenient for us. I mean, I think we're, we're going to, we're gonna suffer in ways we, we are not yet anticipating. Again, I hope I'm wrong about all that. I hope the inconvenience is the worst of it for most of us, but yeah, you know, I, I don't think so. And I think so on the, I think, when we finally do get to post COVID, I think a lot's gonna depend on kind of how we handle this, the worst of this, which I think is still to come. Mm. Uh, one, one of the ways I'll talk about that is, um, I think it's already politicized. I mean, right, the way, at least what I can, what I can tell, not that I have my finger on the pulse of the world, but from what I can tell, I mean, most people are interpreting this sickness via the lens of a political, perspective right a per, per, political party mm -hmm. and you know so mask wearing is politicized but not only mask wearing just the way you interpret what is actually happening whether or not it's a crisis or or not etc i think that's going to get much worse um both because i think the 
the number of cases is going to go up and we're moving into the, the presidential election, right? So the more those things converge, the election season and all the, the ways in which that heightens disagreements anyway, it's going to put our communities to the test. I mean, I think even more than the 2016 election cycle did, which was bad enough for a lot of our communities. I mean, I, I know a lot of churches that split or had some kind of um, soft split around the 2016 election. And I think this is going to be, at least it has the potential to be worse. I think a lot of what's going to happen after COVID is going to depend on kind of how we navigate the next few months, the next six months, say, or nine. Mm-hmm. And, and those are not like prophecies or even predictions. That's just, uh, that's what it seems like to me. I'm guessing more than anything else. Why has uh, politics from secular society informed the Christian body more than the church itself? I don't know if that question makes any sense. I, do you see where I'm going with that direction? Like, is Christianity a politic? And, and if so, how has that politic been usurped by other narratives? Yeah, so I have a lot to say about that. You'll have to you'll have to shut me up. I mean, I think I think it's too simple to say Christianity is a politics, um, but I don't think there is any way to live the Christian life without being politically involved and in in, in a number of different ways. So, I, I, just in terms of the theological framing of it, I mean, I think that the life God calls us to live is more than political and. I think some of this is semantics, so some of it depends on what what you mean by political, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it might be clearer to say, I think Christianity is civic all the way down, mm-hmm. and it's political all the way down, but it exceeds the political because I think the civic exceeds the political. In other words, our life in community, our civic life, right, our, our kind of public shared life, is more than the political. The political is necessary to governing that life and ordering it properly. But Christianity is more than a politics because it's concerned about the whole of life. It's not less than that, but it's more than that. Mm. If that, if that helps, um, and I don't think it's it, I don't think it's a political philosophy. I think it's it's a way of living that puts pressure on all political philosophies. And I don't think all political philosophies are equally good. But I do think that all political philosophies are should feel the pressure of the Christian way of life, and and therefore you know. So what I would what I would want to avoid here is some kind of um, both andism or or what aboutism. I, I don't I don't mean that. I don't mean yes, the right is wrong, but so is the left. I mean I don't think that kind of conversation gets us very far. I don't think all political philosophies are equal, and I don't think that the way forward in in terms of discernment is simply to say, well, everybody's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's, in some sense, that's true, but it doesn't help very much, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, in this particular moment, you know, I think we need to, we need to be very specific about on these issues, Republicans and those on the right are wrong. And on these other issues, Democrats and those on the left are wrong, but we need to be specific. We can't just vaguely say, you know, it's, it's a sign to me that, of kind of moral stupidity when we just simply blankly say, well, those on the right are wrong, but so are those on the left. It's a way of refusing to take responsibility for discernment Mm -hmm. and refusing to actually engage what the reality is that's facing us. So I think over the course of a decade or two decades, if we only ever criticize Republicans, yeah, I mean, it's revealing something about us. But in a particular moment, it may be that the Republicans are the ones responsible for a particular wrong that we need to confront. And next election cycle, that may shift, right? So I, I, I think um, I don't have any patience for the, the kind of both andism that never actually speaks about specifics, right? So I, I would want to want to avoid that. In terms of how we got here, or why is it that so many Christians are politicized in ways that are that are unhelpful that's a complicated story and i'm not sure i understand it all too well but i i do think in general my sense is 
at least with evangelicals, I think what happened, at least part of the story, is that I think World War II, in the year, in the years right before it, during it, and right after it, I think it shifted the ways that conservative Christians related to national identity. Mm. And I think it pushed us toward nationalism in a way that's unique to America, right? So in terms of the Pentecostal tradition, which I think is in some ways an example of what's happened to the broader evangelical tradition. I, you know, before World War I, Pentecostals were mostly a marginal community and much more identified with kind of holiness communities that were sectarian and withdrawn and mostly critical of political power. It's not that there was no patriotism there, but I don't think there was much nationalism, at least not like we experience it now. Mm. But after World War I, and in the build-up to World War II, that starts to shift. So, for instance, Amy Simple McPherson is probably the leading figure in that front. She's a Pentecostal minister in California, in, 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 in Los Angeles, who has you know enormous Billy Graham-level appeal culturally, not just within Pentecostal movement, but you know, across the culture. I mean, I read just the other day something like 10% of the citizenry of Los Angeles attended her church in the 30s. Something like that. Don't quote me, but it was an astonishing number, like an astonishing number of, of people. But that doesn't, that still doesn't speak to the reach of her influence. So she's enormously influential. And she, in in the run-up to World War II, and specifically, specifically, becomes more and more nationalistic, becomes more and more concerned with America is the future of the world, and if America falls, the world falls. You know, and you know, it's it's America is good, Nazi Germany is evil. You know, allies are are the forces of light. The the Axis powers are the forces of darkness. And, and she even goes so far as to condone total war. And then you can see kind of in her footsteps, lots of other Pentecostals are making the same move, right? Where they're, where they're condoning so much so that when you get like the bombings of Japanese cities, which eventually culminates in atomic bombing of Japanese cities. So there were dozens, dozens and dozens and dozens of bombings of civilian centers, fire bombings. But in fact, more people were killed in them than even in the atomic bombings. But the atomic bomb was a red line in a lot of ways for a lot of people. But most Pentecostals and seemingly most evangelicals affirmed that because the shift, I think, toward nationalism. And I, I don't think we ever recovered from that. I think it's just been a matter of that one wave after another of that hitting us, right? Of course, that came under intense pressure in the 60s around the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement. But overwhelmingly, white Pentecostals were resistant to the Civil Rights Movement and um, more or less affirming of the Vietnam War, not in the same way that they had been in World War II, but you can still see that same kind of nationalism. And in the midst of that, there's more and more pressure not to speak to political issues from the pulpit right, where ministers in particular are expected to focus on the gospel and to leave social issues alone. Mm. And I think what we're experiencing now is, is one of the long-term effects of that decision, right? So once you get the kind of hyper-nationalism and then you couple that with a kind of ethos in which ministers are not supposed to be political, what you get then is not some kind of safe space between the right and the left, but now you're, you've already located evangelical and Pentecostal churches squarely in the heart of the right, of the right politically. And now you're no longer speaking to it, which means that overwhelmingly people just assume that the, that right wing politics is the Christian one, the evangelical one. Right? So again, this is complicated and I don't mean to oversimplify anything, but um, this is why, to go back to something I was saying a moment ago, this is why I don't think both andism helps us at all, because I don't think evangelicals really are caught between the right and the left. 
we have been historically we've been associated with the right so much so that what we've seen in the last five or ten years right is a kind of unmistakable proof i think that evangelical equals right wing or at least republican conservative and maybe even evangelical equals white right and so you know i know like anthea butler who's you know something of a fire starter but she she makes that claim that evangelical not only equals right wing politics it also equals white politics right so i i think now on average our churches are much more politically conservative than they were two generations ago mm-hmm. or and much much more politically conservative than they were four generations ago right and so an example of that would be when i look at the literature what i see say in the 40s and 50s is a lot of talk about you know what matters the most is kind of making christian choices as an individual there's a lot of talk about the conscience a lot of talk about not violating your conscience mm-hmm. on issues of politics right in the early years of the culture war you can still see that right so in the first statement that i can find that the assemblies of god made on abortion after roe versus wade there's still language of this is in some ways a matter of conscience we we are against the taking of life but we understand that abortion sometimes happens under complicated circumstances and in those cases you know we leave it to the matter of conscience mm-hmm. i think we've come to the place now a couple of generations later where that that's no longer we no longer assume in our official language that in our community are going to be people with different views of this mm-hmm. we just assume that it's no longer a matter of conscience it's a matter of right and wrong period mm-hmm. and we're on the right side of that and for the most part almost without exception that means we're on the republican side of that on the right side of that right and this is true not only on issues of race or issues uh, like abortion it's also true on issues like torture or police reform mm-hmm. or or economics right you can you can more or less go right down the line on what are the hot button issues right and evangelical churches including pentecostal churches in so far as they're white tend to graph Mm. on that side right and without much care right so that that would have been true less radically but it would have been true you know in our grandparents generation but in our grandparents generation it seems to me there was a lot more awareness of difference and talk about conscience as a way of navigating that difference within our communities and i think a lot of that has dropped away we've been we i think we've been radicalized and we don't even realize how we've been radicalized um I I think abortion has been a major part of that the but it's not only that it's about a lot of other things too right and so uh, this again it's just to start the conversation uh, there's still a lot that I wish I could say but I don't want to take too long on it um, no I thought so. it's great yeah it's great I like the way you did a brief summary of the history of all of this I think that's really important so we can understand how we got here you said something in in that that kind of caught my attention where you there was this ideology that America is the future of the world that was presented then. Even if it's subconscious, do you think that this is still held in the minds and hearts of people? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and that's that what I'm saying is I think so when I I think in the 30s when in 40s when Amy Simple McPherson is saying that, it was somewhat controversial. Mm. In in our circles. Yeah, yeah. I think over time it's come to be assumed. Assumed. Right. It's it's and assumed without much critical awareness, right? So what what I would say is what under the pressures of war, specifically the pressures of World War II, which of course, you know, the background of the depression and the the horrors of World War 1. I. I mean, there's so much at play there, right? And she, remember she's in Los Angeles, which is is you know, a city with exploding population. She was right at that right at the heart of a lot of that interracial work so she's experiencing an old world that's that's lost to us like we don't we don't live in the same world that she lived in mm-hmm. but she but her arguments for nationalism and total war i think just essentially won the day and she's far from alone i'm just saying she she took the lead on all that sure. and 
And then Billy Graham follows that, right? So around around the Vietnam War, Billy Graham is writing to Henry Kissinger and and others senators, arguing for the bombing of Vietnamese civilians, you know, on the basis of what we had done in World War II, right? So he's calling for total war, and those are our leading, you know. So Amy Simple and Fierce and Billy Graham, I mean. A lot of people, I think, have this sense that Franklin Graham and Jerry Falwell Jr. are kind of, they've come out of nowhere with these extreme views. And I think that's really naive historically. I mean, I think Franklin Graham is less careful than his father, but holds more, more or less most of the same views. And I think the reason we feel the contrast differently is that our culture, the culture wars have led to more and more conflict so now franklin graham's comments are not just assumed to be authoritative right they, they get met with criticisms and of course a lot of this is just he doesn't have the kind of personal weight that his father did i mean billy graham was you know an icon in a way that franklin graham just is not but in terms of his views i mean you can find most of those things in in what his father taught as well and and i think a lot of that is um true about Trump, for example, I, I don't think Trump's views really depart that much from a lot of other presidents. Mm -hmm. I think he just does it with less care. He doesn't have the same presence that previous presidents had. He's, he's just crude. He's kind of an exaggerated, cartoonish version of, I think, pretty standard American beliefs, right? And. The same, I think, holds for Franklin and Jerry Falwell Jr. I mean, I, I think they're, they're, we like to think maybe that they're the exception, the aberration, you know, the anomaly, but I don't think that's true at all. They very much grew up in the same world you and I did and are not that different from, from previous generations. It's just our world is different now. And so they're met with different kinds of resistances. So as a theologian, to get to the, the the underlying problem here, how do you meet that statement that America is the future of the world? <laughs> uh, because the creed would disagree with that, I would say. Uh, oh, of course, yeah. So how how do you how do you deal with that theologically? Well, so one, I, th this is the deep end of the pool, but I, I would say that the future of the world is death. The hope for the future of the world is God. And, you know, there's no, in, in our tradition, and, and here I'm talking broadly about evangelical tradition, there's a lot of confusion about the coming of God and the develop and the, and the trajectory of history. Mm -hmm. right? So without realizing it, a lot of us, have, what we've thought of as quote unquote eschatology is really a theology of history. It's a theology of how history will play out and will history play out triumphantly with the church, you know, winning its way to victory over all the enemies of evil in the world, or will the church, you know, hold out against darkness to the end and Jesus come in at the last moment like Gandalf and save us from the orcs. Um, but I think those are both mistaken ways of thinking about how history plays out. My, my argument would be that history is something different from the coming of God. The coming of God is not something that happens in history. It's something that happens to history. It doesn't happen in time and space. It happens to time and space. And therefore, the future of the world is still to be determined, but ultimately it's a future that ends in death, right? So we can, that we can live our way into a future that is more just, more peaceful, and then die, <laughs> or we can live into the world, into the future in ways in which it is less just and less peaceful and then die, you know? So, I mean, I think the, we are headed toward a time, you know, w w eventually some disease is going to come that we can't beat. Right? or some natural disaster is going to come that we can't undo. Now, whether that's a result of global warming or the result of you know, scientific overreach or political um, failure, I mean, 
who, who could who could guess but my expectation is that one where I, I would argue we're at the beginning of history not at the end so when scripture talks about the nearness of the coming of God I think that's a statement about our openness to the God of history mm-hmm. rather than our openness to tomorrow mm-hmm. right so I do believe that Jesus is going to appear don't misunderstand me I do believe that God is coming but I think the coming of God is something that happens to history and therefore is as much in my past as it is in my future. Mm-hmm. So when scripture says every eye will see him, I think that's a way of talking about the coming of God is something that happens to everything all at once. Yeah. It's not, you know, the last dot on the thing that happens to the timeline itself. It's not the last dot on the timeline. It's something that happens to the, to the timeline itself. And that seems bizarre to us because most of us have been taught in eschatology that's just history. Mm-hmm. And but my, you know, what I'm arguing here, I think, is a much more traditional Christian understanding of of eschatology. Um, and if listeners make it this far into the interview, you know, this will give them something that upsets them so much they forget all the stuff I said about <laughs> politics. I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. It's so good. It's so good. Dr. Green, Diana and I love you, and we're so grateful for you and your family. The Sacred Commons is indebted to your work and your witness. Sincerely, you have changed our lives and continue to. So thank you so much, Dr. Green, for being with us today. To those of you at home, head over to Amazon or wherever you buy your books from and order Surprised by God. I think it's a great starting place to engage with Dr. Green's theology. We'll leave a link to the book and a video about the book below. And come back next week where we'll pick up with part two, the second half of our interview with Dr. Green. Okay, that's it. But real quick, happy anniversary, Diana. Thank you for 17 years of the most deepest companionship and friendship I've ever known. Everything you do is filled with grace. I've admired you since we were kids from day one. John, Luke, and Maddie adore you. Our shared life is one big orbit around your love. We love you. I love you. Happy anniversary, D. Okay. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next week. Peace.